Okay, third and uh, last speaker of this session is, and I tried it, I trained it a little bit, Kostas Papagianopoulos. That was an amazing attempt. To an amazing ask. attempt, thank you, that's very polite of you. Um, and he will speak about low randomness masking and shuffling and evaluation using mutual information. The floor is yours. Right. Thank you, Benedict. So, like the rest of the talks uh, during this session, we will be discussing masking, uh, the infamous countermeasure that can actually uh, at least try to hide intermediate values from the prying eyes of, of an adversary. Now, we will also be discussing shuffling, uh, the countermeasure that actually likes to reorder cipher operations and confuse the adversary. But unlike the previous talk, we will not be extending uh, the previous uh, properties. We will not be delve deeper into glitching or glitch resistance. Uh, we will be looking at randomness. So, uh, as a quick overview of the talk, we will discuss first that masking and shuffling actually are very painful uh, when it comes to random number generation. Uh, they, they take a lot of time to do that. And we will propose some new countermeasure variants that actually recycle randomness. They are better at it. Of course, uh, computational performance does not come free. Uh, there will be discussion about pitfalls in formal security and how does recycling damage the noise amplification stage of masking and shuffling. So let me get right onto it. We will start with a quick introduction about masking and shuffling, most of which has been already mentioned. So, masking is probably one of the most popular countermeasures in the community. Uh, it asks the adversary to recombine shares, and if you split it into eight pieces, then it will become very hard to perform a recombination. And we re it has the property of noise amplification, and we really, really like this property because actually it has an exponential effect in the number of traces you need to attack the implementation. More importantly, um, masking is very computationally demanding. So if you implement the Shaisa High Wagner, then you are looking at quadratic randomness complexity. There have been more recent works uh, that have been improving on this bound from Belaid et al. But still, even under these improved situations, then you still have quite a big overhead that you are about to face. And these conclusions per persist throughout masking, most of its variants, and sometimes go into higher order threshold implementation. So no matter what you do, you will face uh, the RNG cost. Now, similarly, shuffling is also quite widely deployed. It permutes blocks. So if you are processing in a serial fashion the S boxes of a cipher, and then you will go from one, two, three, and four, and you will permute their order, uh, perhaps three, one, four, two. And again, the countermeasure performs no noise amplification in a different way than masking, but still. And of course, it comes in with an RG overhead, which is approximately k log k random bits if you want to shuffle k things around. So, from our experience so far implementing uh, ciphers, uh, protected ciphers in several devices, we, we have agreed that the RNG is quite a considerable performance overhead. Just to give you some taste of the figures, some people have tried to implement a second order AES on AVR, and they use the pseudo random number generator, and these were the results, like roughly 38% of the total computation time was spent on RNG or when we tried to implement second order present on an ARM Cortex-M4 and we decided to, to, to use the true RNG that came in packed together with this device, then we were uh, in this situation. So roughly one out of four cycles was wasted in RNG. And if we go into even more extreme cases, how about a fourth order AES implementation? that is actually quite fast because of neon assembly, but does the terrible mistake of using randomness from dev view random, then the situation will be really ugly. Huh? So, of course, this is a very naive case. Uh, people won't really do that, but at least it shows that if you do not put the required attention into RNG, then you may face this situation, like a very fast cipher and very slow RNG. All right, but we, we decided to do something about that. So in this spirit, we looked more into it and looked out into other works that were exploring this concept of reusing or recycling randomness while masking around. And I feel the best way to explain this is through uh, an example. So 
Like previous presentations, let's take a look again at the size of high Wagner. Let's assume two multiplications. Both of them are second order secure, and, and they are completely independent from each other. So you, if you feel like you can think of them as two different executions of a cipher, or two different uh, computations that they, they do not link to each other. And in the first one, you have to produce z equal x times y. The second one, c is equal a times b. And in order to do that, you can see the, for the formula with the partial products. And highlighted in green, you can see the random numbers that are necessary, that it is a necessity to inject them if you are to maintain security. So. The first step was, um, yeah, let's think very simply and let's try to reuse some numbers from the first multiplication, store them perhaps in memory, and then reuse them in the later multiplication. So it would look a bit like this. Now, instead of using T0 and T1, we'll replace them with W0 and W1, which we already have generated before, you know, to reduce the randomness cost by two numbers, which doesn't seem a lot, but if you put in, uh, like, if you see the big picture, the AES S box will have lots of those multiplications. So in any case, it will be beneficial on the long run. The natural question that comes is like, all right, now you have a very strange gadget that consists of two multiplication gadget, and you want to prove that this is secure in some sense. So using the formal security tool uh, by Coron, you can actually prove that this uh, two-multiplication gadget is 2NI. So, so far, so good. You're resting uh, well. The next step uh, is to you know, become a, a little bit greedy and try to recycle more. So I thought, yeah, well, why not grab all of them and re use them in the second one? They are independent. It should be OK. And this actually will reduce the, random uh, the randomness cost even more. However, once you p throw again it, uh, the thing into the tool, the tool will complain. It will tell you this isn't secure. For example, check value Z2, XOR C2. I have found a two probing attack uh, that can actually, a two uh, tuple consisting of two intermediate values that can actually break the thing. Because uh, W1 and W2 uh, here and here will actually cancel out with W1 and W2 here. So in the end, we can observe that if you recycle excessively, you will be hurting probing security, even between independent gadgets. The last step of this, uh, let's say, search was uh, to actually look around for efficient multiplication gadgets. So we did try to look for uh, Isai Sahai Wagner gadgets of security order one, two, and three. If you do not recycle uh, using this gadget and two multiplications, then you're looking at two, six, or 12 random elements needed in your computation, while if you do recycle, then you can drop it down to 1, 4, or 8. So there is a, a well, let's say, 20 to 30 percent improvement in this situation. It can be actually quite helpful, given that RNG is often slow. Even, uh, let's say, the more no, um, randomness-aware BBP gadget, which was published by Belaid et al. Uh, this already had in mind uh, randomness, and it already tried to reduce randomness. But if you recycle on top of it, you can still gain some nice margins and improve your situation. All right, so, so far everything looks OK. We can actually find non-interfering gadget that actually recycle randomness and improve the situation. Uh, but the problem actually starts when it, we, go, we go away from the formal uh, security and we move towards the noise amplification stage of masking. So a reminder of the central limit theorem in our context, at least. Uh, let's assume that a random number is being recycled. And since it's being recycled, you will emit uh, several, it will emit leakages multiple times, let's say L1, L2, and LM. All of them follow a normal distribution with a mean and standard deviation. Now, if someone grabs those leakages and averages them, then the new distribution will follow again a norm, uh, it will be again normal, but the standard deviation will be divided by this factor over here. So essentially, I'm restating that someone who is able to observe those recyclings will be able to denoise the signal. Even if everything is fine, even if the thing is probing secure, it won't matter. Repetition will hurt you. And this has been shown several times in the context of more uh, horizontal attacks. All right, so in order to showcase this scenario and perform, let's say, more uh, concrete noise analysis, 
we define two adversaries. So there is adversary C1, he's quite naive, he doesn't see recycling, and there's adversary C2 who can actually see recycle, he can average, and let's see how this will work out. All right, so here's the pitfall. If you start from the solid red line over here, then that is a third order attack on uh, uh, using uh, n uh, the naive adversary on something that actually is recycling, but is recycling a modest amount of randomness. And if you are compare it to the actual situation, you will see that the naive adversary cannot take advantage of it. This is as good as attacking a third order uh, scheme without any difference. Now, you will observe that the dust red line shifts to the right. So an adversary who is able to see those repetitions, he will be able to shift the curve to the right and reduce the security. So the second observation is that we can actually uh, exploit recycling to our advantage. Now, finally, if you move to the blue lines, uh, the first one is not recycling, the second one is recycling a little bit, so the dust blue line is moving to the right. And if you really recycle a lot, if you want to really cut down on the cost of RNG, then you are moving towards a dotted line, which, is, uh, a which may have a huge impact on security. And finally, perhaps the most important point of this uh, graph is that this RRM, this uh, Recycled Randomness Masking, is actually a trade-off between security and randomness cost. It's uh, nothing more than that. And it is very potent for the countermeasure designer to have such a trade-off in his hand. Uh, he can actually twist and turn a little bit on the randomness, turn it up and down in order to fix the security that he aims for. All right, so we did talk about uh, recycled ma uh, randomness in masking. We'll do the same thing in shuffling, but it, it is quite easier. So let's take an abstract case of shuffling. And here I have to shuffle three layers of a cipher. And each layer has four blocks in it. Blocks could be anything. Right? They could be whole cipher uh, sections, or it could be just assembly instructions, or blocks of assembly instructions. And the randomness cost to shuffling three layers independently, and each one has four, it will go around 24 bits of randomness if the formula is correct. Then a nice option is uh, if you want to cut down on the randomness cost, and we propose, why don't you partition the layers? Instead of actually shuffling all four in columns, well, why don't you cut down a little bit? And we call this partition shuffling with partition factor fp is equal to two. And if you do that, then you can recompute the randomness cost, and it will actually reduce to 12 bits, which is less than 24. So yeah, we thought we got a small advantage over it. All right, so that's not the only options. There are actually quite a few. Uh, one more is that f instead of original shuffling, we can actually do merge shuffling. So we can merge the two layers. So layer one and layer two used to be different, but now we put them all together, and we will shuffle them all together. And we call this merge shuffling with merge factor fm is equal to 2. Now, again, if you s sit and compute the randomness cost for this, then you have to shuffle two layers. And um, it, this will again end up in approximately 16 bits, which is less than 24. So again, we feel that we got an advantage through our, uh, through our S. As you might have already expected, doing all those things, increasing from, let's say, the original case where you do not partition and you do not, shuff and you do not merge any layers in while shuffling, and comparing to a case where you partition or to a case where you partition and, sh and merge, then we will see a damage in the noise amplification stage of this thing. So starting from the solid blue line, the curve starts shifting to the right the more you merge and the more you partition, or in general, the more you cut down on randomness. And of course, it damages the noise amplification stage. And ag once again, I will restate the same thing, that RRS is a trade-off that the countermeasure designer has at his disposal, and he can actually uh, use it to make an implementation cheaper and less secure, or the other way around. So finally, some future directions for this type of work. And here I say towards parametric design for side channel countermeasures. I will explain this. Uh, first and foremost, we have demonstrated how to reduce the randomness cost in masking and shuffling. And now I think it's time to start talking more about this random number generator. Um, I haven't seen that many open source implementations of this thing, and I think it would be nice 
for the whole community to agree on what is actually required for an RNG used in masking or shuffling. And it will encourage more discussions. I would encourage more discussions on this and more research towards this direction. Now, second and perhaps uh, more interestingly is that um, I would like to, at least personally, see more uh, of a parametric approach when we design countermeasures. And um, if, for example, in the modern countermeasures, we just decide the order of masking, we implement it in a device, and that's it. And up until, uh, well, let's say, a few years ago, we didn't have that many options. There were several countermeasures, people were implementing them, but I feel that we start scratching more and more beneath the surface of those options. So now, instead of just the order of masking, I can have, I have so many variants to choose from. I can choose uh, X-order masking that recycles random numbers, merges a few layers, and many more things. So I have far more available options than compare what I used to. So to close down this presentation, I will start and I will attempt uh, an analogy with, actu with actual architecture uh, between shuff uh, shuffling and masking as countermeasure architecture and actual architecture. So in the 70s or 80s, it was uh, uh, the age of modernity and we used to have uh, buildings that were built in the international style. And the mantra was more like, uh, let's just pick the number of floors and then form Sarah's fac function. That was the mantra of modernist designers. And then, you, like masking, yeah, you just put many orders of masking and that's it. While I feel that now we have the ability to move a more towards a more parametric model, so a bit like um, the turning torso in Sweden, so which is essentially the same building, uh, but now we, ha we have a better understanding of uh, structure, so we can twist and mold it in a better form, huh? in, a, in a form that still serves function, but in a form that optimizes the function itself. And that pretty much concludes the talk. So, are there any questions? Yeah. Questions for Costas. Who wants the microphone? It's really soft, eh? don't be afraid. <laughs> All right, let's start. Um, so for the recycled masking, you, um, you require at some point, as basically pretty much everybody does, that uh, inputs or that these two operations that recycle, they must be independent. Um, but for example, if I implement an S-Box, I will have many multiplications that are not independent. So then I need to add extra randomness to make them independent. So that would be one option, adding uh, refreshing gadgets in between. But then I, I would feel that this would defeat the whole purpose of it, yeah. unless you have extremely higher order and the quadratic randomness hits you more uh, than the linear randomness of, uh, of the other gadgets. But still, I, what I have in mind is different executions uh, while storing in between the random numbers. So you, you do one AES iteration, you store those numbers, and then you reuse them in the second iteration. Okay. And then you have some sort of uh, guarantee. But of course, this implies storage. Okay. More questions, comments? No. All right, then um, we'll have a short break, and we'll begin again at uh, quarter past five. Thanks again to all the speakers of the session.